Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Corbell, known to my friends as Marv, and this time I'm speaking with the uh, writer, actor and director sometimes as well, Nicholas Tukoski. Hello, Nicholas. Thanks for speaking with me today. Hello. Thank you for having me on. I'm very excited to be here. Me, me too. I've been looking forward to this, especially since don't want to get too fanboyish, but I've listened to a, a lot of shows that you've written Particularly, a lot of people, if they listen to the credits, they'll recognize you from work with the wonderful Aaron Mankey. Oh, yes. With this production yeah. company. 13, yeah. day, 13 Days of Halloween, 13 Ghost. And then you've got Tomorrow's Monsters. I'm trying to think of other podcasts or audio book dramas that you've been a part of, that you've written or been a part of. I was a co-writer in the Mantua Caves that, that came out under Blumhouse and I heart couldn't. Yeah. I could not think of the big company that I have written for, so that that just came out earlier this year, and that was a lot of fun. A uh, Southern Gothic supernatural murder mystery. Yeah, that got recommended to me, so I added it, and then I thought, I wonder why it's added that to me, and now I know why it's recommended <laughs> that show to me now. That was me. I'm the one who's actually sending the recommendations out. <laughs> I Every single wonder. listener. <laughs> it's me. I just there's, That's what I do most of the time when I'm not writing. There's a show or film there somewhere. Yeah, there's got to be. <laughs> so how did you get started then? Did you start as an actor writing your own material, or, or did you start as a writer and go into acting? I, I was... I started acting when I was much, much younger. I did a show when I was in school, and... I was just, I did it on a lark and ended up loving it and started following that along the way. But my very first professional job was right out of school. It was for a theme park, of all things. So hmm. I ended up there playing a playing Deputy Sheriff Cuthbert C. Cuthbert. So I was a, a, a goofy deputy character at this theme park. And as, qu as Christmas was rolling around, they, they knew that I also wrote some mostly as a hobby at the time, but they asked me if I would write a Christmas play for this theme park. And I ended up working there and becoming the, the sole staff writer that they had there for about nine years. Wow. And while I was there, I started working in Atlanta's sort of nascent film industry from Atlanta, Georgia. And the film industry here over the years has grown immensely. Most Marvel films are shot here to a large extent. They end game and Infinity War and all of that stuff. Any scene that was shot in New York is actually Atlanta, but there were so many filmmakers around town that I started working with some of them in a, in a program called The Dailies Project that was here. And that was effectively uh, an on-the-ground film school where we would be all be given a challenge, like a movie that was all about focusing on a fight scene. And then we would write a short film around it and we would work on the craft of the fight scene or work on the craft of Dogma 95, which was a, a film movement that was effectively everything that you see on screen is real, meaning there's it's all natural lighting and it's just ambient sound. You don't add music to it or anything like that. But Daly's Project is where a lot of local filmmakers would come meet with each other, form teams, and just start practicing filmmaking. And in that sense, I started working on my writing, my professional writing in film a lot more. And that's where I met David Bruckner, who, yep. who was, has been my writing partner on and off for years and years. And Dave, at the time that I met him, had just completed a film called The Signal, which is about a strange signal that comes out over TV and radio and kind of drives people insane. Stephen King, at the same time their movie came out, Stephen King published the book Cell. So it was, it was interesting timing there. But 
but anyway, Dave and I met and we started working on on film, on screenwriting together. And we made we made a, a few shorts at first. There's a great one based on a Harold Pinter play that we call talk shows based on the Harold Pinter yep. play One for the Road. And then and then we were approached in 2011 about about making a short horror film for a new anthology that the people at bloodydisgusting.com were putting together. And so we wrote a project called Lily at first that became Amateur Night, which was the first short in the VHS franchise. And that's basically the first 15 years of my career compressed very tightly. But that was it. I started as an actor and then just by luck happened to fall into a writing job. And I think about my time writing for theme parks because it was just constantly writing stuff for live audiences. I think of it, the Beatles, when they went to Hamburg, how they were just, they were just sloppy little rock outfit. And then they had to go and play at a club every single night for a long time. And they just, they got sharp and that's what it is. It's just when you're forced to do the same thing over and over again, you just get, you get more proficient at it. Do you, did you find that use it, keeping the Beatles analogy of, of Hamburg? My, my assumption there would be that because they were doing so many hours of performance, mm-hmm. they would hone the songs that they're performing and and learn more and expand their repertoire, essentially. Exactly. So with your own writing, while you were writing for this theme park, I'm guessing that you're having to write to specifics. So therefore, that hones your ability to be able to zoom in on what's needed to be done and, and almost like troubleshoot on the hoof. Absolutely. And that was, that was a big thing about it is it was restrictive writing. Yeah. It was, we have very little budget. We have this small stage space. There's all kinds of stuff going on around us. So you have to write something that is loud, that is focused, that can draw an audience and keep them. And you have, and it's like a 20 minute block that you have. I became very proficient at writing very low budget material. Yep. which is great especially in film and particularly for horror because horror is a is one of the few genres in film that really thrives under low budgets and unknown actors it's it's a really good entry point for film if you're thinking about coming in as an independent filmmaker people love to get scared and low budget horror can be done low budget. That's a it's a great entry point for somebody who wants to write or direct or or act. Um yeah, it was being able to work at the theme park for so long and then learning how to write for a new medium film while I was doing this. Yeah, it absolutely honed the craft just as I was going. I can think of a lot of films where because of these restrictions or whatever, a, 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 a famous one would be, go back to the 70s, you've got Jaws, where the restriction was that the, that the actual shark didn't work most right. of the time. And it's under these sort of circumstances with films where sometimes that creates an added thing that you don't actually expect because you've not expected this to happen. So you work around these things, and it's these workarounds that create that extra... Looking at it from a musical point of view, in in a sense, or, or mi- mixing that because I'm a musician and I'm free time. Oh, excellent! That that's the hook, essentially, that pulls people in. Sometimes these restrictions or these problems that you get actually create that hook that pulls people into to enjoying it. Absolutely, and one other thing too, and Jaws is a great example of this. One thing that makes horror incredibly effective, and one reason that it's so hard for these these big, long series, horror series that are on Netflix, I think about Fall of the House of Ushers, the most recent one. A lot of fun. It's a really fun show. It's really hard to keep up suspense. It's really hard to keep up that air of mystery over the course of many episodes if you are seeing the villain. The faster you see, the faster you see the monster, the faster it gets demystified and stops being scary when you have time to really look at it. And so much of horror is the unknown. Yes. What is going to happen to me? What is this thing? What does it want? And 
I think they got lucky with Jaws with the shark not working because that meant you had to, that meant there was this lurking shadow killing people and they know what it is, but they they can't put their eyes on it. So when they finally do see, when it finally does come out of the water onto the boat with all of those teeth, it's terrifying. And I think that's, that's a bit, that's a, one of the reasons that, that low budget horror can work so much. It's cheap to not show something. Yeah, it's cheap to keep it hidden in the shadows. Yeah, even films that have the budget. I'm thinking Alien, for instance, the first Alien film. Oh yeah, that I prefer the first one. To, I love the I love the Alien series anyway to to a certain degree. But those the first one to me is the standout because you've got that element there where they must have had the budget to do it. But Ridley Scott held off showing you the Alien until so far. And then you had the same thing again with the thing, which I think is another classic of John Carpenter's. Oh my, I love and, the and thing. And that yeah. that holds off on it as well. Like you said, it's the suspense that the longer you hold off on that. And I think one of the funniest ones, actually going back to old times, would be Psycho, where you actually see the person all the way through, but the suspense is added to because you don't know that's the actual killer until right. she suddenly he suddenly seen. With his mum's out, his mum's cl- clothes on, his mother's a clothes on, and then wow, that is the the Shyamalan moment, essentially. <laughs> yeah, effectively, yeah. and that, that that's it. Horror is horror and suspense are about about knowing that the thing is there, but not knowing what it wants, or not being able to see it, or not knowing if it means you harm. And I think that's, I think that is something that is hard to do well but can be done in the writing in the performance and not necessarily with a special effects budget and i think most of i think most of i think most of my favorite horror is not necessarily monster horror it's 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 the human unknown i think that i enjoy one of my favorite horror movies is not a horror movie at all in any way, shape, or form. It's a Western, but it's No Country for Old Men. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Anton Chigurh is terrifying because he's got a code of ethics, but it feels so alien. It yeah. feels absolutely alien to you, and that's what's terrifying. It's that there's this man walking around looking at you. <laughs> he's got a stun gun, a cattle stun gun, and it, and you don't know what he wants besides he wants the money but you don't know what he's capable of you don't know what he does in his day-to-day life he is a complete blank except that he murders and seems to take some pleasure in it and i think that the coen brothers excel in that kind of in, in those types of villains but also cormac mccarthy who wrote the original novel that it's based on his he's a quintessentially american writer in that he is so focused on the violence of everyday American life. Um, You look at any of his work and he, there's always that one character that just seems to be the complete unknown, this sort of danger that, that sort of stands in for the country that stands in for the land. I think the most famous one is the judge in blood Meridian. I don't know if you've ever read that at all, but he's just this, he, you have no idea what he's going to do at any given moment. He's just at at one point he is like taking gently taking care of this child whose family was killed in a massacre and calmly soothing him. The the lead looks away and when he comes back, the child is dead in, in the judge's arms and the judge is just dropping him off. And there's something about that 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 evil that seems so much bigger than man that seems to plague mankind, but is so also at the same time, so specifically human and can be tucked inside of a single brain or a single heart. I love that shit. This is Mac Jackson from the forever adventure network, the home of the MacGyver podcast, the never gets old podcast and the MacGyver SG one audio series. And you're listening to pods like us. Staying on that go and uh, aligning it to one of my favorites, Tomorrow's Monsters, our yeah. audio drama that you wrote there. Yeah. That, that 
that hits on something that I've seen it in a few things where, you know, mm. even in Doctor Who and whatever and things. And the interesting thing there is that essentially it's a look at the evil is from within man itself, essentially. Right. When I've always found that fascinating. It's a bit like the day the earth stood still. I always go to the original of that. And, oh, yeah. and you've got that, you've got the alien coming in on there and you end up finding out that actually the evil or the, the problem is not the alien person. It's actually mankind themselves. And, and essentially, Tomorrow's Monsters is the same where it's man creating their own actual problems or their own right. evil future, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, I think we were using Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as the sort of the idea or the framework on that one. But yeah, talking about, excuse me, we've my wife is, is speaking to a contractor just in the other room. It should end momentarily. But I think we were focusing a lot on the issues of greed in the tech industry and how frequently these things are rushed out to market that aren't completely finished yet or aren't ready for human consumption yet. You look at the debate over AI right now. They're, the scientists that are the programmers and the people that are making this aren't 100% sure how it's learning yet. They just no. know that it's absorbing all of this information, working it out and spitting it right back out at us. And I think in the sense of tomorrow's monsters, one of the problems that people in a capitalist society frequently look at is productivity, yeah. how much time, how much time we have to be productive in our lives. And we had a Max Fuller, who's the primary antagonist, who came up with this idea to give us eight more hours of our life back. You don't have to sleep anymore. While ig ignoring the very real problem of what the long-term effects are on the human brain of not sleeping for a long time. And those effects are well known already. It, it's psychosis, effectively, in the long run. So to have Max Fuller be focused so much on the product and on what it means and on the money that it will make them, in effect, ends up damaging himself horribly, becoming a monster himself by creating this sort of new technology and that, that wasn't ready for consumption yet. I don't know if that answered the question you were looking at. You had it. It does. It does. I don't want to. I don't want to stray too far into it because it gives away a lot. But I like also the fact. That essentially, you've got the dare I say the evil millionaire magnet that that is a you find it all over the place, like in Bond films, for instance. Oh he yeah, is, he is the Max Largo or whatever the character's name is that right. you get in those sort of films. Towards the end, now that there you've got the string that suddenly you, you're stringing it along all the way through. And the clever thing is there that as a listener, you don't, or as somebody that's enjoying it, you don't actually with that one realize that there is that underlying arc there going on with Max, where suddenly it's almost like a realization. It's the, it's the sixth sense moment where suddenly you're like, hold on a minute. That's been going on all along, but I never saw it. And you've got the same thing with Max there, where towards where at the end you suddenly realize this thing that's been going all along with him personally. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was that was really interesting to to write in and to try to layer that in so that so that it wasn't too obvious what was yeah. going on through the whole thing. And I think being able to work with the idea of his his twin brother who had died tragically in his youth and how that created a schism in his family and him trying to continuously try to keep up with this ghost, this person that no longer existed. The, because Max to his father was this real thing you could see in real time, whereas Ben, his dead brother, was this potential, this imaginary potential that spread out into the future. And having Max work against that and largely embody that within the show, it, it we had to go back and do a lot of rewrites to make sure we got it right, that it wasn't too obvious or it wasn't too hokey. And, and I, I think that 
Dan and I, uh, Dan Bush, my co-writer, and he directed that. I think Dan and I were able to find a very good balance where it felt very, it felt very natural and very human. The sort of internal struggle that Max went through that sort of, with the aid of this technology, became this major antagonistic force in, in the series. I think that all forces of antagonism, every person who's does evil or is bad has something happened somewhere. Something happened somewhere in their past. Something made them into this thing. I don't believe that people are just born evil. We have to be taught. We have to be taught good as well, which is why parenting is <laughs> such a terrifying roller coaster. Um, I have a toddler right now who is just, she's on that perfect balance right now. She could go either way. She's Toddlers are impetuous and strange, and you have to channel that into something good. Because if you don't, they just they just break stuff and go nuts. People we follow sometimes our worst instincts. But if if you grow up in a healthy family, you frequently are able to. You know, most people become like happy, adjusted. Or as somebody who you know who is raised without a mother and whose brother dies, and his whose father takes out that death to a certain extent on him, it's probably going to end up a little bit messy. Going to have some issues with the attachment issues, going to have some inferiority complexes. You could go down the psychological route with that one quite easily. Yeah. Yeah, you really can. He's yeah, basically a case of the brother who's died. He's only got that set specific period where his brother's been around. So He's done all these things in that shortened amount of time, and right. he's being compared to an entire lifetime that that Walter's got. And yeah, and yeah, I, mean, I think I, mean, that, I meant Max actually. Oh yeah, I I I knew exactly what you meant, but uh, yeah, I think that Max, even after his father becomes ill with Alzheimer's, even after he's dead to a certain extent, Max is still constantly in conversation with him, conversation with that sort of imaginary Walter and in competition with that imaginary Ben, just because a relative passes doesn't mean that they're not still very present in your life. Even the absence of somebody still feels like something. It still feels very real. And I think that I think that Max internalizes to a very literal degree the co competition with his brother and trying to gain his father's affection and acceptance. And I think we I think we also got very lucky to have Darren Chris, who big Broadway star was in Glee, did has done a lot of stuff since he came in and we had another actor who was going to do the role that we were very excited about who had to who had to drop out last minute. And we were able to get Darren Chris on and he just immediately was able to he's got his energy in real life is this very golden retriever energy he's very excited and very enthusiastic about the project that he's working on and super friendly and very much the sort of charismatic type that max fuller is but he still is able to he was still able to just drop his just drop the volume of his voice to a little bit of a whisper. And when he would get to that point, there was something almost sinister in whatever he said and was able to really quickly embody all the aspects of this character. Um, and one of the first things that we recorded was the scene, the last scene between Max and his father, Walter. Walter, who was played by the absolutely fantastic Clark Gregg from uh, Agent Coulson and all the Marvel movies, and uh, I just, I was, I, I was a huge fan of his from way back in the day when he did uh, Aaron Sorkin's Sports Night. He was like a minor character at the very end of that, and I just loved that guy. But the two of them working together for the first time, listening to the to how quickly they were able to form this bond and how real it felt immediately was absolutely incredible. And I think that the there's only 
in a screenplay, at least, there's only so far, or, or an audio play, there's only so much you can do with the script without starting to get too obvious. You need to, what you want to do is lay all of the breadcrumbs for the actors to find their way to the truth in the story. It's just not unlike a, a blueprint versus the house that it becomes. It's all there, but if you don't have skilled builders and the right materials, it's not going to be a very good house. And and our cast for this, John Boyega was absolutely a dream to work with. Great guy, really dynamic. Darren Chris was fantastic. Marley Sheldon, who played who played, oh my goodness, her name Cass, Cassandra yep. Berkeley, was absolutely fantastic. And I was a huge fan of hers fr- from The Sandlot. I don't know if you ever saw this. Yep. Yeah, Wendy Peppercorn, an early crush of mine. So being able to actually do like scene work with her was great. She was so funny, so great to work with. But having this absolutely stellar cast took this sort of cautionary tale we were writing about new technologies and made it incredibly human. And I think that's what in that's what I think the best horror and science fiction has in it. It, it and what it's triggered by is the sort of human element and how we deal with the unknown and how we deal with the strange. And and our, the, all the performances were so fantastic. And just to be able to, as an actor, come in and play against these incredible talents was incredibly gratifying. And now I've got this great scene where it, in one of the episodes, John Boyega gives my character Finn a great pep talk. And now I just have a, I just have a clip when I need it of John Boyega giving me this giving me this pep talk. You can um, do it. Yeah, which which I wrote. Too. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. So welcome to and volume for all a deeply reverent and lovingly irreverent exploration of the history, philosophy, and future of the greatest music in the world, heavy metal. I am your cinnamon host, Crunch. I guess. Quinn. So did they did they actually record? Were all the voices recorded like together? Then were they, were they were they were talking with each other for that? Because uh, I know I did. I know I did a voice for a for an audio drama myself recently, and I found it really difficult because I was just basically talking to thin air, and I couldn't actually hear anybody responding to me. And I find found that really difficult as somebody oh, wow, who's yeah. not. Not really done much acting since childhood, really. That that is difficult. We recorded this at we recorded this three months into the COVID pandemic. I, I don't know why I said COVID. It's that's the only pandemic we've had recently. It was three months into the pandemic, and Boyega was in London, and Dan and I. And a lot of our, a lot of the actors playing supporting roles were in Atlanta. And then Darren and Marley were on the West Coast in Los Angeles. So we, we concocted a setup where we were all on Zoom. Everybody was sent basically a recording package with the microphone, any of the components that they needed so that they could record themselves and then and then upload it to be sent to Atlanta to be assembled yep. effectively. But, and of course, it was a, a nightmare to schedule because you had three different time zones. But yeah, we would, as often as we could, the leads at least would all be on Zoom together so we could at least hear each other over our headsets. And then you know, they would rec- we would record what we had to with those actors, and then another actor would jump in, and somebody would jump out, and these it would be a Zoom meeting that would last eight hours. It was okay. just like the first half of the day we were recording with John, the second half of the day we were recording with our West Coast cast, and and that's how it was put together. I, I think that I believe our principal production we were in production for close to three weeks doing it, but most of it was done within two weeks. Yeah, and it it just it went pretty fast, but everything was completely out of order. Like you'd be recording something from episode three and then jump to do 
two scenes in episode seven because that's when we could get Darren and then you'd be jumping back into episode five. As the actors were incredibly nimble in that sense, but we were definitely jumping around a lot and you could easily lose your place. But we had an excellent first AD who was able to, Sarah was able to keep us just like on point, let us know what was happening in every scene, where our characters were, how it connected to the other things we were working on during the day. Because even as, uh, even as one of the writers who lived in this world, overall, the script was probably like 350 pages from start to finish for all the episodes, maybe closer to 400. But even as somebody living inside of that for a year as a writer, you just, you lose, it's amazing how quickly you can lose track of yourself in 400 pages if you're jumping around. There, there were things that there are, and this is, I don't know if this is true of other writers, but for me, when I've worked on a project for a very long time, I'll be on like, uh, I'm, I'm working on another project for Aaron Mankey right now. I'm where I'm yep. the sole writer on it. And I'm on episode 10 right now of 12. And I have to, the number of times in a day that I have to go back through or check the outline to make sure that I'm not repeating something or that this is in line with something that happened that I set up in episode two, it's stunning the amount of time you spend just checking your notes, just to make sure you're not screwing things up as you move forward. And it's amazing how quickly you can forget a scene that you wrote. There are definitely times where I've gone back or I'll listen to something that I wrote six months before. I'll finally get a chance to really listen to it. And I'll totally forget that I'd written this. It happens absolutely regularly. So for actors who didn't, who weren't a part of that process to have to jump around a lot, it required them to be very nimble and it required them to be able to shift gears incredibly quickly, which thankfully they absolutely we're all masterful at. What would be interesting would be because you've done it in that sort of scene from there, a scene from here and a scene from there, would be if any of those actors have come back to listen to it and then commented on, oh, well, that's how it all comes together. <laughs> uh, none of those actors, uh, none of those actors particularly did. I think they were, I think that they were so hyper-focused in that moment. And I think I've spoken to John once more since then when we were doing some pickups and stuff. And and yeah, I think that he, at one point, we were redoing something. It was like, okay, I get it. I get where this was. I understand how this wasn't working. And I think that that probably came from all of us who are in that production at that moment. Everything was so tightly packed together that every once in a while, something will fall through the cracks and you don't realize it until you're in post and you go, oh, that doesn't sound right. Or like, we forgot this line, so we have to go back and pick it up again. But I know for me, I definitely went back and listened to something. I was like, I remember that day I was having, okay, I'm glad we got this performance right. <laughs> but yeah, in the moment, I was very confused. Yeah, it is. It, it's also, it is very strange, especially because I don't do a lot of the post-production in this. I'll listen to rough cuts and stuff like that to give notes, but it's really strange when you get so in the weeds about, as a writer, you get so in the weeds about how the turn of phrase sounds or what it means or how this fits in with this moment. And then as an actor, you get so caught up in the moment of, does this feel real while I'm doing it? Does this feel not just believable, but do, do I believe it when I'm saying it out loud? That you, it's, it is hard to step back and sometimes you get surprised by the big picture when you finally get a chance to see it. Because even as a writer, it's really hard to get a, a grasp of the big picture. Really, I think even the people who do post, it's very difficult. I think that the people who really get to see the big picture for the first time are, is the audience. So you can have an idea, but until the thing is, while you're still working on the thing, it's so much about the nuts and bolts. And you get so bogged down the details that like, it's really hard to step back and look at it. After a while, it's really hard to see it. So I think that the audience benefits from all of the nitpicking. But I think they're also really some of the first people who get to come in, sit back, and just see the whole thing take shape. And I think it's a lot easier to, it's easier to absorb than it is to produce, I think. But I think that it's just also really hard for the artist who's working to be able to see that. So to answer your question. <laughs> Finally, yeah. I believe that the actors do probably 
hear something for the first time that they may have done 20 takes of and go, okay, that's why I wasn't getting it right. It was because it connected to this scene a little bit earlier, two pages earlier that we recorded like six days later, even though it yeah. takes place two minutes before we, we didn't. So yeah, I'm sure that the actors probably got a little bit of whiplash and were probably pleasantly surprised at how things turned out because the process itself could be so rushed and so chaotic. And that's that's any production. That's audio dramas. That's film. Film, that's television. Stage, yeah. television. That's everything. Yeah, I was going to say that you must find that as an actor yourself when you've been in, when you've been in things, been casting things, and, and then you film it out of sequence. And... How does it work? Because it's almost like pulling your mind apart and putting it together in a different manner, in a sense. Is is it easy to actually do that, to just go into a film situation or a television show that you've been on or film or whatever, and you've just done them out of sequence and you've just gone in there and done it? What's going on? Or sometimes you've, have you done that yourself where you've done these things and then you're like, I have no idea what <laughs> how any of this works until you see it as a full thing. I've I've definitely, you can get discombobulated when you're in production. Everything is moving fast. You're not getting as much sleep as you'd like to be getting. But I think of, I always think of Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, how this man effectively is, has the ability to see his entire life from start to finish and is able to pop in at any point in his life. And this is very much like that. As actors, you're given the script so that you can get a chance to look at it. There's rehearsal, the rehearsal process so that you become highly attuned to the scenes themselves and how they fit within the larger story. Academically, you should it should follow that you're able to jump in and out in that way. Realistically, it's very difficult if you do a very intense scene and then the next scene is like a very like upbeat scene. It does require a hard downshift in that sense. And I think that it's a challenge, but I think that I think that the best actors, and I don't necessarily count myself in this, I think the best actors are so practiced at it that that it is not impossibly difficult, that it can be a little bit of a challenge, but a challenge that they've tackled enough times that you know, having to film something out of order is not going to affect the way that they feel in the moment because they know they can drop in here and this is the scene where the character recognizes this important moment. There's an epiphany here or he figures out a problem here or his father dies and he's absolutely devastated. Okay, now I've got to go three back and now instead of my, being devastated by my father's death, I'm desperately worried about his health and i I'm working my fingers to the bone to do that. I think that you just become, when you become attuned to the script and the character enough that it's not, it's not too difficult to be able to shift between those moments, as long as you know what those moments are and where they fit in. That's why we had a very good assistant director on this, was to keep us all on task and remind the actors themselves like where their character is in this moment. The AD is able to let us know where we are. And then Dan, as the director, would come in and set the scene again. And that's really one of the director's sort of main jobs is to get everybody focused and on the same page to be able to give the performance that is their best performance. But yeah, it's it's hard, but it's it's also part of the fun, I think, of doing it. It's part of the reason that people enjoy doing this sort of thing. It's solving these little psychological puzzles we're handed. Well, we'll, we'll move on in, in, in a moment, but sure. uh, keep into following on from what you've just said there about, about your own characters. I, I thought that, that the character of Finn was very realistic, a very real person in the middle of a situation where, you know, you've got the big characters of Max and of Jack and, not to put a slight on that, I'll bring, I'll bring yeah. a bit out of that, but with John as well, with the performance that John Boyega gives, you've got a very, very specific performance there from him where he's also got, not to the same degree as Darren gives with his characterization, because they're completely different characters, but John's character, at moments you've got a Jekyll and Hyde with him, but to a lesser degree, because he's less 
informed by the circumstances. Uh, I'm trying not to say anything too much for people that have. No, you're doing great. <laughs> heard it. But in the middle of that, where you've got these extreme characters that are even cast, she's extreme from one to the other. She can be. She seems to be very. There's these little elements of almost like caring in the background, but they're covered by her being this big like character. Whereas yourself playing Finn is a more humanistic and a more real just person there in the middle of these enormous characters. Yeah. And I think that's what I really enjoyed about Finn is he's this hyper intelligent man who is just in love with creation and is in love with solving problems and is just, he's there. He's not there for the money. He's there for the science. He's there to be able to solve problems. And he comes up against these problems that he doesn't know how to solve. And one of those big problems is his best friend is losing his best friend to whatever is going on. And it's not just what is happening to Max in that moment. It's what it's how Max is acting on the company that they created together. It's how Max is acting on the science that they both were so precious about. And I think for Finn, he's just he's just trying to keep, I think, the science front of mind, the thing that they created, the precious thing. He's trying to perfect that. And he knows that if it's not perfected, he knows that if they don't work the kinks out, that it can be dangerous. And I think that he's in real conflict about how to deal with his best friend pushing this forward. Like, for a long time, he knows something's he knows something's very wrong and he knows it's affecting everything. And I think that once he really realizes what that is, what I one thing I really like about Finn is that even through this whole story, this thing that he's worked on for all these years, he's still willing to throw the whole project away in order to salvage this friendship. He's willing to effectively jettison what they're doing in order to pull Max back from the edge. And and not to give any spoilers, it, it doesn't go great for him. No. But that's what happens, I think, to I think that's what happens to well-meaning people who are thrust into thrust into these morally gray situations where, you know, uh, if somebody stands to benefit by making billions of dollars, the quiet morals of one man in that sort of sphere are not going to mean anything. Those are going to be brushed aside very quickly for the billion dollars. And I think that Finn is Finn was not in it for the money. I think realized too late that the money was the object and not the science itself. At least for that aspect of Max, that was I think in control as the CEO. Because I think that there are aspects of Max who were right there with Finn, and that that scene where they go out to the desert and do a lot of drugs and. Finn wakes up and Max is scratching these equations into the tile at this place. I think that's the moment where they are the closest was with was the Max's dis- just creation of this thing on the ground and Finn seeing it for the first time and realizing how f- incredible this was. And funny story that the tile house where that takes that scene takes place, it's a real place out in the desert in California, right outside of Joshua Tree National Park. And and it's a place that that David Bruckner and I yep. went out to when we were working on rewrites for a project. We went out there and we did all the drugs and we got nothing done. It was like the opposite experience. We ended up running around at nighttime in the desert howling and all the stupid stereotypical things people do on drugs in the desert. Magic memories there. Yeah, it truly was. It was just a it was a good enough experience that I was like, okay, this is gonna end up. This is a perfect the experience that I did not have but could have that the the ideal experience where we created where we solved the problems in the script. I'm just gonna I'm actually going to make that a scene within Tomorrow's Monsters because it fits so well for these two characters and their relationship. Um and I, I think that I don't put a lot of my own life into these projects, 
but that was one of the rare instances where a real experience from my life wormed its way into the product. Hey, this is Chris from Podtastic Audio, the show that I have created to help you create your amazing podcast. And you are listening to Pods Like Us. Believe in. I smiled when you said you're working on something with 12 parts for Aaron Mankey, even though things for Aaron so far have been 13, haven't they? So 13 oh, well, days, uh, tw- 13 ghosts. Go on. Actually, no, it's 12 ghosts. Oh, yeah, 12 ghosts, yes. Probably. Yeah, yeah. And that's project... the 12 days of Christmas, the 12 ghosts, yeah. And it was, I came on to 13 days of Halloween. I, I was supposed to be writing. I was just going to write an episode for them. I wrote the pilot episode. I wrote for them. It's a with a short story called "We Harvest at Night" or "They Harvest at Night." I think is the title. But uh, yeah, once we they were looking for somebody to write a framework around the first season, so I came on and did that for them and wrote the first last episodes and then the sort of wrap around the intro and and outro of each episode. And after working on that a couple of seasons, I had the idea for Twelve Ghosts, which I pitched to Aaron separately pitch to Aaron and to the producers at iHeart separately. Um, and which honestly is, I, I don't, I don't tend to pick favorites on my projects, but 12 ghosts was definitely a labor of love. And, and I was able to use a lot of, I run a show here in Atlanta, uh, a, a, a live stage show called right club. Yeah. And we take, we take, Two opposing writers, we give them two opposing topics, and they get seven minutes apiece on stage, and an audience votes for a winner. And and the piece is very wildly from personal essay to, there's poetry on occasion, to fiction and comedy. And, and having done this show for, a, we're in our 13th year right now, having done this show for as long as I have, I've met and gotten to know a lot of very good writers. <clears throat> and I was able to hand select some really excellent stories after sending this sort of prompt out to all these writers. And I was able to really, because we were all local to Atlanta, I was able to sit down with a lot of them and work through issues and edits and stuff like that. And yeah, it was, I think, the best way to manage an anthology project like that. And VHS is is a good example of this, and 13 Days as well. Uh, if you hire the right people, the, the right writers, the right actors, if you hire the right post-production people and give enough guidance that they know where to go and then let them take it and make it their own and have real buy-in on the project, you're going to have a project that is good, that is strong, that has heart. And I think that 12 Ghosts was that for me, was this experience where I was show running. I was dealing with all the aspects of the show. And I did write the sort of wraparound and I wrote the finale episode. But so much of the work done on that, on my end, was letting other people do their job and then gently making adjustments to it so that it all fit together properly. But the vast bulk of the creative work on that was not my work. I was just there to help put it in the proper place. And I think that I think that the key to making a good anthology series is just that. It's hiring people that know how to do their shit and then letting them do it without getting in their way. I think that for a lot of showrunners and a lot of producers, there's this this need to exercise authority and there are definitely times where you have to put the brakes on something or gently shift the way it's moving but i think for the most part so much of doing it properly is fighting against the instinct to be in tight control so much of the time because then everybody gets frustrated there's miscommunication at that point people stop assuming that everybody's like acting with good intention. It's just, a, it's a recipe for a disaster and for a miserable experience. And I'd rather the projects that I work on be exciting to the people working on them. And I'd rather, I'd rather all of my staff 
from the writers to the actors to the assistant director to the post production, I'd rather them feel like they have real buy in. Because when you have real buy in, if you when you have ownership over something, you're gonna do it to the best of your ability. And I think in the long run that show that shows my baby. I really adored it. And being able to work with Malcolm McDowell was it was a lifelong dream come true. I I was I've always loved his work. So being able to actually work with him and, and having him actually perform my own story yeah. Uh, yeah. was mind bending to me. It's just one of those experiences you don't get a lot in life where you get to meet one of your heroes and it should be added, find out that they are absolutely lovely. Just a real pleasure to work with so friendly, was talking about how much he enjoyed how he got started, BBC Radio. He was just so excited to be able to do this. And he was tucked away in a small booth in Ojai, California. And we had a really pleasant, really pleasant long session where he took the material and made it really sing and also took excellent direction, what little I had to give him. Because he did not need a tremendous amount. He came in absolutely ready to play the innkeeper. In the- yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's one of the, I was going to say, you said that yours is like a small part, but it isn't in a sense because you, you've got this thing where you're, so you're the best anthologies in some ways are the ones where you've got that connective tissue in a sense. It, it's almost like the Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone. You've always got to have something to bring it in and to bring it back out again, to, right. to have that there in, in essence. And w- what you're doing with Malcolm, but also not just Malcolm, but I'm trying to remember the other character as well. Uh, uh, Annabelle, who is Annabelle. played by the fantastic Gina Rakiki. But th- there's an arc there. You've got a story going there between in the 12 episodes that's going that basically her realization of why she's there. Is, right. is happening in the background, and that's what you're doing there, but you've also got the, the last episode as well that's completely yours as well, which is essentially mm-hmm. her story. But that is really important because, like I said, it, it's the connectivity of an anthology. An anthology right. isn't just like a, this story is there, each story is different. You've got to make it, to make the Twilight Zone, to make the Outer Limits, you've got to have that connectivity that joins them. Yeah. No, absolutely. And 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 I wanted something that unlike 13 Days of Halloween or VHS where just nothing ends well for anybody involved. I wanted I, w- I wanted to tell a sort of a Christmas story. I wanted to tell a tale of redemption with this so that you could hear your spooky ghost story but still feel a a nice human warmth throughout the whole thing. It's your Christmas carol. It is. It's your Christmas carol. Yeah. It's a bunch of ghosts helping this one spirit get right. But yeah, I think that, I think that's what's, what sets it apart from some of the others is that it, there is still the air of mystery and there is still a possible air of menace, but in the end, in the end, everybody wants salvation. Everybody wants to believe that all of the things that they've gone through are not for nothing. And I think that we, in what we set up, we were able to really deliver that redemption really well for everybody. And it, the strange thing about the wraparound on this one is a lot of the ghost stories that were told don't end well. A lot of them are true horror stories. And um, I wanted for them to be able to stand on their own, but I also needed to put them into context of our story. And in some ways, that sort of softens the final blow in, in some of these. And in some ways, it, it just completely changes the context of what we're looking at. I think of one of my favorite episodes of that was an episode called Hello Again. And it is a... It's a cab driver who picks up the same ghost every Christmas Eve. And he picked her up on her last night alive and drove her down to the docks. 
not knowing that she was going to walk into the water and kill herself. And so now he's he picks her up every year because he's got this intensive guilt that when he saw her again and realized she was dead, he drove her to the same place. She only says the same couple of things that she said when she was alive. But through this story, you get to hear this just absolute tale of despair and loss and and regret. And I will spoil the end of this particular episode. In the end, he asks if he can go with her into the water because yeah. his wife, who he was married to for all these years, has passed away. He's losing, like he has a degenerative brain disorder. It's just he wants to go. He wants to see if he can see his wife beyond the veil. And when I was handed that story from Ben Bolin, who is best known as the host of Stuff They Don't Want You to Know on iHeart, which is a great conspiracy podcast, and they're in- incredibly funny and very smart guys. Ben is also a just a stellar writer. But he handed me this story, and it's so tragic. But the problem is, I have to have this guy who's just killed himself telling the story to you after it's done. So it's obviously he's here now. So I, that one, I had to take very great care. I didn't want to change the story at all. So I had to figure out how to resolve it in two or three pages at the very end. And this idea that this guy has been, has lost so much and finding out what's on the other side of the veil and realizing that maybe it's all the shit that he has lost. There's something beautiful about that. And it totally changes the context of the story to have that. If I just ended the episode with him walking into the water, that would just be, that'd be devastating. And it, but it also wouldn't fit my series. A lot of the wraparound stuff was it's taking these disparate stories and making them all ex- making it feasible that they all exist in the same universe, and that's hard. <laughs> that that is that was not easy. And I think that the last story that the one that Malcolm tells, Keys to Dead Houses, uh, is a story that is about reconciling reconciling those stories and also reconciling. loss dealing with your own losses and what kind of the type of thing that that the kinds of losses and the kind of life that that makes a man like the innkeeper in the end that was definitely a challenge being able to take all those stories and place them together like that especially because this isn't a series that's one a week this was coming out one day after the one other day at time, yeah. to be binged. So if you're listening to three episodes in a row one day, if they are, if they all are just tonally all over the place, then the whole thing is going to feel like a mess. You have to be able to bring them back so that there feels like there's a sense of motion over the course of a lot of episodes. It's, it's essentially, it's a bit like me, me, most people won't see it as such, but essentially the television series at its best Quantum Leap was a, mm. was an anthology, mm. and they're all completely different stories from one one episode to the next. You've got the murder of you've got the assassination of John Kennedy, for instance, in there, which is a really classic episode. But you've got all these different types. But that's the interesting thing is with all that, you've got to keep the framework of what the overall is with that series. And that series did it well as you do with yours, where you've been able to like just with Twelve Ghost. Just do the wraparound so that it actually works, even though every single story is completely, almost a different genre to each other. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, except in the end here, Annabelle does go home, unlike poor Sam, who never makes it. But yeah, I think that I agree with your initial point that the best anthologies have that motion behind them. Because it, it's the thing that keeps people coming back as much as the stories themselves. People love Serling. He was just like such, he was so integral to, besides being the creator of the show, he was so integral to the experience of sitting down and watching that every night. His voice just opening the episodes. And that little like, the little like moral he gives it at the end that ties everything up really 
beautifully. Yeah, and those stories were also wildly different and I mean, frequently completely different genres. But yeah, I've always been a fan of the anthology. I think that there's something really nice about being able to, as an audience member, sit down and not know what you're going to be able to expect from any given episode because this last one was a ghost story and then the, the one before that was a serial killer who ends up fighting zombies or something. But also for the creator to be able to tinker and explore different genres or different stories within a genre. There's something really a lot of fun about that. To take it back to, to VHS, for one thing, we had no idea what they were doing. The way that VHS was set up, at least in the initial one, I can't really speak to later ones, but we had no idea what they were going for. They just said they needed a short found footage horror film, 20 minutes or less. And we didn't know if it was going to go anywhere, but we knew that they were giving us $20,000, which is less than a micro budget, but it was enough for our purposes. It was enough to do what we wanted to do. And Dave and I went out into the woods, into a cabin in the woods and spent like a week just banging out ideas and finally settling on this one about a bunch of college kids going out and trying to find ladies to make a sex tape with these really terrible characters getting their comeuppance in the end and then yeah and then we the initial script we pounded out in a day and it was all over the place and it was but it also had a lot of the moments that we that people came to know about that particular segment the I Like You was in there at the very beginning because it was just like, what's the weirdest thing that she can say that could be both a come on and like the creepiest thing to come out of this very alien looking woman's mouth? Yeah. And it was just, I like you. It's straightforward. It gets to the point. But when Hannah Fearman says it, it is also just one of the creepiest things you've ever heard. And there were other, there were moments that we were like, okay, what happens? What, what, what do we do at this point? And I remember there was one point we were trying to decide how to, how we were going to dispatch Patrick, who's the jokey, laughy dude. And, uh, and I don't remember whether it was Dave or I who said, well, hey, we just rip his dick off and throw it in front of the camera. <laughs> and we both cackled and we we're like, we can't do that. And then we got very quiet and looked at each other. It's like, can we? We'll just put it in there. We don't know what these guys are. We're like, we don't know what they want. So we'll just, we just put it in there. And that ended up in the, that ended up in the film. And like, it is, it is probably the most graphic moment of our segment. And it's also shocking. And I still think incredibly funny that we were able to get that in there. But we sent them the script and they're like, great, go with it. And yeah, production of that was a week and a half it was breakneck we moved through that quickly but but yeah and we got to really kick off the vhs series and it and we got a spin-off out of it and it was a lot of fun and it was fun to see hannah back up on screen as that character again wow. um yeah lily was a fun character to to write because she has no lines so you it's, she's just this like you're writing action and so much of it just relies on the actor that we were that we hired and hannah definitely brought to that character what we wanted yeah and the script itself we ended up sort of deconstructing and instead of it being just a bunch of instead of it being a typical screenplay we broke it down into effectively very tight improvisational prompts where it's like you have to hit this point you have to say this line you have to get to this line because this line is important for this next thing going on and so we were working with the actors dave as director and me as co-writer we were working with the actors to guide guide them through these moments and and a lot of my favorite moments were never scripted, were just something we worked out as we were rehearsing. Joe Sykes, who plays Patrick when he's sitting on the couch in the motel room and starts cackling and like, what? And he says, I'm just sitting on a couch, man. 
I don't know why that is one of the funniest moments in anything I've ever worked on to me. And the first time I saw it with an audience, it got a really good laugh. I think it was just a necessary tension breaker in that moment. Hi, I'm Bob Jeffy from the Daily Dad Jokes podcast. You're listening to Pods Like Us. By the way, do you know where whales and dolphins get their news? From podcasts. Bye for now. So I'm looking Sorry. up a film. I'm looking up a filmmaker now because you've just reminded me. Oh, but okay. That, but that is very much along similar lines to I don't know if do you know the British filmmaker Mike Lee? Where the name stands for what is he? What has he done? What's he done? What has he done? Let's have a look. Like Secrets and Lies. Or oh, he, yeah. he did Mr. Turner, where he did the where he was where he was the act the artist Turner, and how he makes films is very much like that. So he will have a he will have a construct or have an idea of what the film is. So you'll have a so in each scene you'll have you've got to hit your mark here and do this there and this there and everything else around it. You come up with around that, and that's how all, almost all of his films are made. Where he'll just have the idea of this is the general idea of what we want the story to be through this. Other than that, you make up your own lines and work off each other essentially and. I, yeah. I've never seen a film like his that's not like that, really. And it's an interesting thing to watch because then you're, it's more like a symbiosis in a sense where you're allowing everybody who's a part of the film, the, the cast, the people behind, behind the scenes and everything. That's how the film is created. All of you are the creatives, essentially. And it's, and the thing is, if you have a good, strong director at the helm helping to guide that along, that symbiosis creates some of the most amazing work. I loved being able to work like that. And as the writer in the film, being able to work with the actors on that kind of thing and and to be able to inform a lot of their decisions. Writing is frequently incredibly lonely. You're just on your own doing this stuff. So the rare chances where you're actually able to work with the actors is is always a delight for me because it's this lonely life of letters. It's really boring on occasion. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of sameness to the day to day. So being able to actually work with work with actors one on one and see your work taking shape in front of you alongside theirs is incredibly gratifying. And I did actually, I am actually in our segment in VHS for about 30 seconds as the bartender and <laughs> at the bar where they all go to and meet Lily. I did get to work in front of the camera very briefly in that one. Two of his, by the way, if you're interested, two of his films, Mike Lee's that I like a lot would be, I've mentioned Secrets and Lies. Yeah, uh, I've Abigail, seen that one. I love yep. that one. Abigail's Party, which you might not know, that's from back in the 70s. And that's fascinating because... The whole idea is that there's a there's like a dinner party with these people where all the friends have come around. But during this dinner party, essentially, it starts one way where people go in there and you think that this is like the perfect couple or whatever, Abigail and her husband and, and this, that, and the other. But it descends through the whole thing where eventually, over the period of time, and it is a slow, it is like a release in a sense where you get to the end of it, and by the end of it, you realize that, I'm going to use a naughty word here, in, in essence, it's all rubbish, and that you realize that they're all live, that they, suddenly these things come out, and you realize that their relationship has turned to shit, essentially. But there's this belief that people see what they see there is this perfect couple, and then that mask is eventually revealed throughout it. And it's all, he's just allowed those actors to basically say, we want to start here, but at the end, it's going to be somewhere completely different, almost like a Philip Glass music piece, in, right. in essence. And it's those little bits throughout that lead to that. Yeah, it's really fantastic. It's, and it's amazing too. It's amazing that he's able to do that with the actors as they're going along. I think it's absolutely incredible. And you've got, he's got to have a really strong guiding hand and a really strong idea on this, on what the central focus needs to be. 
because you get a bunch of actors in front of a camera Im- improvising, things can get away from you really quickly. But that's really cool. I'm going to check out that one. That sounds really cool. That that makes me think of what you've said there about directors with that. I saw a, an interview clip with Pesci. Joe Pesci was saying in an interview oh, yeah. clip about when the films with Scorsese. And he says that Scorsese, he likes actors to come up with things in a sense, but he said that the difference is that Scorsese, once that once that film camera rolls, what you're doing, even if you've come yeah. up with an idea or whatever, you're going to change, you can do this in the piece. He will not allow on screen, it's why he had improvisation, which is why as much as The Departed is a really good film and incredible and Martin Scorsese loves it, he had a problem with Jack Nicholson because Jack Nicholson does it on screen and it irritates the hell out of Scorsese when people do that. Yeah. That's what it's an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. <laughs> <laughs> that's Nicholson and Scorsese. Yeah, that's great. It's I, I don't have as much I don't have as much experience working as a director for film at all. That it's strange. I think that the difference between the two mediums with film you can really get away with a, a certain amount of that because you have the visual there to yeah. help tell the story. So you have the actions right there. It's a lot harder to improvise through audio and make it make sense in the large sense, because you're missing that whole visual element. And you have to be able to inform the audience of what's going on throughout that. And that means the language has to be a lot more exacting. I've listened to I've listened to some podcasts where there is improvisation and it's great. Like the comedy is great in those moments. I don't know how many dramas are improvised through in that sense. I'm sure that there are some out there. But I know for me the sort of specificity you have to have in the writing in order for the story to make sense. I worked on, I worked on editing a story for another anthology series. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say who it was because I'm just going to talk about a problem they had that I don't know if it got solved in the long run or not, but where there's a lot of action that's happening throughout this one episode. And The problem that they had is that their writer had written all of these stage directions, and it's just all sounds. I'm like, nobody is going to, if you just have a guy running with all of these sounds around him, it's just going to sound like nothing. Nobody's going to know what's happening. You need to, you need, there needs to be somebody setting the scene. There needs to be narration. There needs to be, the thing that's, that's hard is if somebody's got a gun on screen, you see the gun. If somebody's got a gun that in your audio drama, you're going to have to say that there's a gun, even if you've got a gun. Yeah. You've got a gun or, Hey, put that down. Whoa. What do you, what is that for? The sound of the hammer being pulled back is not enough because out like completely out of context, that just, it just sounds like metal scraping metal. It just sounds like a click. And so you have to be very specific with the language or very specific with the direction so that if a gun is pulled, you know that a gun has been pulled because of the reaction, because of the performance of the reaction. Yeah. And you can go down a rabbit hole on that all day long with examples. But but yeah, I think that improvisation is very difficult in an audio drama because it's hard for the actors to come up with their own material and then also put it in context that the audience understands. It's just an extra layer of things to think about that that I think probably stymies or gums up the improviser's mind, which has to focus on the moment that it's in. Yeah. Hey, this is Jeff Cummings from the Best Song Podcast the show that is telling the stories of every song nominated for the Academy Award. You're listening to Pods Like Us. Yeah, it's a tricky medium audio to be able to do that because you haven't got all the, like you said, with film, you've got the visual as well that you can include into that. But with audio, it's difficult because everything is about what you can hear in a way. And yourself, with your writing that you do, I'm going to mention another name here as well, but it's 
it's interesting that, that Aaron works with, Aaron Mankey works with people when it comes to the dra dramatized series that he produces. He works with writers who are, who really know it incredibly, like yourself, I'm going to say also, because he uses Lauren as well for Bridgewater as well. And she's yeah. in, Lauren Shippen is incredible at being able to know what to write for audio. And so are you as well, because what are elements to bring out so that you're telling the story essentially that you wouldn't need all those elements in a film version, but you need all these elements in there. But it doesn't sound convoluted, almost my jokey thing that I just said there. Oh, you've got a gun. You've got to <laughs> right. make it that that people right. know, but don't put it in such a, a way as I was being humorous with the way that I said it. That is not right. how you would actually bring it up, but oh, you have no. to bring these things up. Yeah. And it's funny because that that is a challenge, but it's... I think it's a very, it, it also becomes a very cosmetic surf surface level challenge that once you've figured out a few ways of getting around that where it didn't sound tinny or unnatural, then it's something that becomes a lot easier when you're going down the line. It's like writing in any different format. It's like writing poetry versus prose versus stage play. The mediums are different. The... They all have their own different kind of language. But once you become proficient enough in it, it's, it all becomes storytelling. It's just, it's just being like, it's like being able to tell a story in English versus being able to tell a story in French. It's like they're all language. The shape of a story is still the shape of a story, no matter what language you use for it. So I, it, it, it becomes more a question of just like minor structural things that you tweak here and there. And once you get proficient at it, then it just becomes background noise like everything else. It's just part of the process that your brain goes through automatically, I think. But yeah, I think that it's a challenge when you're first doing it to figure that out. But like every, like any challenge, once you're practiced, it's just part of the process. I've enjoyed this conversation so much that I've not been looking at my notes whatsoever. Oh, <laughs> I've been enjoying it too. This is a, I really like this interview format. You're, you're very easy to talk to. Thank you very much. Let's have a look. I, I think we've hit, we've hit a lot of these points already, actually. Gone into, how to fine, fine tuning a script and how do you know it's right? Do you, as a writer, do you come up with an idea and then you fine tune it? Are the bits that, are there any bits where you, for instance, you've come up with an idea for something? And you thought, I like that idea, but there's something about it that just didn't work in context with the whole that you've taken out of there. And what's the process of deciding what works for a script and what you need to take out of the script to make the pacing work or make something else work in it? I'll just, I'll just walk you through my general writing process. When I have an idea that... When I have an idea that I like, because I just, you have, you can have a hundred ideas in a week that are all just kind of garbage, but every once in a while you get that one idea that you can't stop thinking about. And that's when you found like a thing that you have to focus on. My process is more than half of my writing process is the outlining process, especially for something as large as a, a 12 episode series, but even a, a screenplay, even a short story, it just starts as an outlining process because that's where I solve all of the major structural issues. If you can, if you have just a 10, 12, 15 page outline, it's a lot easier to scan up and down through that and figure out, okay, if I change this scene here, it's going to change this. It's much easier than changing it in a 95-page screenplay or a 400-page audio play script. So I'm very careful to work out the problems before I really write the first word in the screenplay, say. But once I've worked that out and I know that I'll be able to sit down every day and I'll be able to get through this scene or this scene and I'll know what's next so that I don't get stymied. I always know what's next. Then the easiest part is writing the first draft because I learned early on, I have a mantra when I'm writing and that's any part of the process I'm at, but particularly the first draft, 
my mantra is just write badly. Just, right. just write the shitty version first because you're going to have to rewrite anyway. So just write out the worst possible version with the dumbest, most obvious dialogue and just get through that first thing because then you've got stuff to, to work with. And that's when the craft comes back really hard uh, because I would say maybe 10% of the time is spent on that first draft and the rest of it is spent in outlining and then whatever's left, 40% uh, goes to the rewrites. And if you have a really tight outline and something changes, you discover something, then you can go back into the outline and figure out where that, that change can be made throughout the rest of the script and how it affects things. And then you can act on it in the larger, in the larger draft. Um, and then a really important part of the process that, and it's the scariest part of the process, I think, and a lot of writers hate doing it, and I hate doing it, and that's sending it to trusted readers. Yep. Sending it to readers who you not just trust to not hand it off to other people, but who you trust to be honest with you and brutally honest. I don't ever hand a script to somebody without saying, I need you to tear this apart. I need you to find every weak spot, every chink in the armor. I need you to find it, and I need you to point it out as loudly as possible. Don't be nice, but please be succinct. Because frequently, once you get down into the weeds of something, and we think we talked about this earlier as like actors like down deep in the weeds, like once you really get in the weeds of something, it gets really hard to see the big picture again. But like, I'll pass my work to Dave Bruckner or Zoe Cooper, who was one of our co-writers on Mantawak. I trust her inherently to just take what I have and set it on fire <laughs> because yep. that's what you want. Because that's how that's the only way you know where the structural problems are or where something doesn't jibe or something doesn't sound right or you need to pump up the volume on one scene. And uh, you take those notes and and you apply them and you just keep polishing. And the writing process frequently doesn't end until post production. If your work, if you're overseeing post production, you can frequently lines will get cut at that part, or you'll realize there's like just a line that's needed to bridge two scenes. And uh, yeah, but when it comes down to it, the, I think the most important part of the process and the part where you realize what can stand and, and fall really well is in the outlining process. It's in the beginning. And that's why it, that's the part that takes the longest most of the time. I know that took the longest for, for Tomorrow's Monsters in particular, because on that script, Dan Bush, who was the director, executive producer, co-writer on that one, Dan had... It was originally written as a screenplay, and then and then he then he wrote it out as a television pitch package. So yeah. it was just like an outline for a pitch package, and that's what he brought to me. And it was we discovered through the writing process that John Boyega's character, who was always going to be the lead, he initially was a reporter that was digging through this and we changed it so that he actually went in within the company and that he was in the industry which is how he got his brother connected to it which is how he got into it but it was through the writing process that we realized that in order for this to really work in order for us to get an idea of how the technology works jack has to be able to experience it so that the audience can experience it with him and that changed the trajectory of the whole thing just like discovering like the sort of parallels between Jack's brother and Max's brother Ben and how that that's how they connect on the sort of human level. Yep. These were all discovered in the writing process early on, but they were all discovered throughout the outlining process because we had to create a much different sort of story. So we had to find that human element yep. and that's how we found it was through through the dead brothers and through Jack like sacrificing himself to us to an extent by taking the shut eye to solve this problem the stakes needed to be raised and that was all discovered throughout the outlining process they said you need a human you need the human aspect there with within it 
essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's in any genre, it's the the best stories told in any medium or in any genre, I think revolve around this sort of human element, revolve around the sort of emotional effects of this. I think that the best horror, or at least the horror that resonates the most with me is horror where there's, where it revolves around some deep trauma that's having to be worked out. Midsommar was so fantastic and she has her entire family get murdered and, and the sister kills herself. If she didn't go into this incredibly sunny, welcoming environment with some deep-seated trauma that she was working through, it wouldn't have worked as well. It wouldn't have worked at, at all. Her finding this community, this family, this acceptance throughout all this horror, it wouldn't have the same impact. Same with Hereditary, all of the stuff that he does is really incredible. It's got that very deep human element. And I think true horror comes from this soft, squishy humans being thrust into this dangerous environment where you don't, where they don't know how they're going to come out the other end, how they're going to be transformed by it. It's the human mind and the human heart meeting the, the great unknown. I can't remember the name of the film now. You're making me think, of, <laughs> oh, dear. What, what's that? Uh, what's that Clint Eastwood one where it's, um, oh, dear me, almost Civil War period. And he ends up being injured and he goes to that place. It was recently remade where it's all these, they're like sisters or nuns or something, like a nunnery or oh, something he goes oh, to. Yeah. That's one of those where you've got that human side of Clint Eastwood's character. And I think that's actually a really good Clint Eastwood film as well, actually. It's one yeah, of his better. I, I can't remember, remember the name the of, it now. of it. Yeah, they made another one with, with what, Jeff Daniels? I think so. Is yeah. It? The remake? Oh. Yep, I know what you're talking about, and I cannot recall the name of that in the dusty filing cabinet of brain. I know. And that's got some really good horrific moments in it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so you, you said, what was it, your exact words were something like, write the shitty version, essentially, of yeah. the script. Just write badly. Yeah. yeah just write badly. And I Just thought, write badly is like one of the most important I used to spend so much time beating my head against the wall trying to yeah. get through scene work when scene work, the first version should just be the framework of it. You figure out how to do that later on, but you got to have it all laid out in order to be able to move the pieces around. It's one of those things that turning it back to me with creating or writing songwriting, I, I realized that after so long. And uh, it was funny because I watched that Beatles thing, Let the Get Back as well. Yeah. And I was watching that and then I noticed something in there and I thought with my own songwriting, I used to sweat it down and go, oh, got a great first verse, can't get any further than that. And right. then I had this sort of realization that I thought it was part of a songwriting challenge that I did online where somebody just said, basically, whatever you just write it. And if you've not got something, just write. It's going to be crap. And then after that, then fine tune it and edit it into the song that, that it needs to be. But at right. least you've got the framework there to base it around. And the reason why I mentioned the, the, the Beatles thing, Get Back, is that John Lennon in there, because George Harrison's trying to write, I think, he's trying to write the song something. And, right. and he, he can't quite, we can't get past this bit. And he's saying to John and to Paul, he says, look, he goes, I've got this. He says, I've got this great idea. He says, I can't get past this bit and this, that, and the other. And John Lennon says, turns around to him and he says, look, he goes, whatever it is, just come up with something to fill that gap in. Makes me, or something, cauliflower. And he comes up with the word cauliflower in it just to fill that gap up. And then John says to him, so he says, just do that for wherever you've got these bits. Just come up with any old nonsense word get the song finished, and then he says, and then clean it up later. And I thought, right. that's it. And that's yeah. how it works for them, how they were so creative with that, is because they could get past what a lot of writers have. That is essentially the way to get past writer's block, as it's called, yeah. is you just basically just get the idea out there, no matter what it is. Even right. if you've got these crappy bits in there, get the whole idea from start to finish out there, and then fine-tune it later. 
Absolutely. And yeah, I think so much of my early career, so much of the absolute agony of the beginning of my career would have been avoided had I, somebody just said, just do the shit version. Don't worry about this. Yeah, it's really, it was really interesting to, to watch their creative process. It was really fantastic to watch that. And, to, and also really heartening because there's a certain amount of the creative process that you realize is just universal. The frustration of not being able to get that thing right or just being stuck where you are or just, em- just feeling embarrassed putting something out that's just not quite right and realizing that you want to fix it. There's just so much of the struggle and and the sort of revelation that is inherent to the creative process in that. And it's really interesting to see how universal that is. When you see people that are considered the gold standard struggling with this thing that you're struggling with, you think, okay, I can, I, this is universal. I can do this too. This is just a human problem. And it's just a thing that you have to push through and overcome. And I think that I think that a lot of people think that the arts, writing, songwriting, I think they, they think of it as this great mystical thing, as these God-given talents. And it's none of that. It's an interest in something combined with combined with just constant practice. Writing is a craft first before it's an art. It has to be a craft. The art comes in in the details later on. The, but the craft is the hard thing. And I think a lot of people just want to think that I have the story inside of me and I'm just going to tell it. And it's such a good story that people are all going to connect to it. But if you don't have the craft behind it, then nobody's going to, nobody, you're not going to know how to connect properly to people, or you're not going to know the things that work, the processes that work. What it comes down to in the end is that it's not this God given gift. It's self-driven. To become a good artist, you just have to put the work in. And that's and what that means is that anybody who desperately wants to can do it. But it, what it also means is it's a lot of work to do it well. And so I think that's what I think separates the the wheat from the chaff in the long run is the fact that it just that there's no mysticism to it. It's just a lot of backbreaking work. But I don't know. I think that's also heartening because I think that so much of life is like that. I think so much of the things that we do are like that. You just have to, if you really desperately want to do it, then you can. It's just going to take a really long time. And just write badly because that's how you start writing better. That's right. Yeah. Hey, this is Danny from One Minute Podcast Tips, the show that helps you be a better podcaster in just a minute a week. And you're listening to Pods Like Us. Are there any future projects then, speaking about writing, are there any future projects that people should look out for? There will be a new anthology project coming out, hopefully in the early spring, called The Passage. And that is, that's figures, this season focuses on figures from American history, who are notorious figures from American history. And the whole conceit is that there's a ferryman who is picking up these people at the moment of their death and bringing them on to their final destination and the price of his passage is that they tell their story and some of these are very straightforward accountings of violent lives and some of these are absolutely we have a j edgar hoover one that is also by ben bull and that is a just wild science fiction story about the the space race in particular. And that is how the ferryman is played by Dan Fogler, who's perhaps best known from uh, Fantastic Beasts. And he's absolutely fantastic. His performance is very Bertolt Brecht, Tom Waits. Mm-hmm. It's just a very weird, fun character. And, and a really bizarre, fun anthology series. I've got another one that I'm working on currently with Aaron Mankey that is, it's a, a vampire story, um, but it's a, as much about the pandemic and capitalism as anything else. It's billionaire vampires. So that'll be a lot of fun. And that, that one has a lot more humor to it, I think. And 
Dan Bush and I are currently working on season two of Tomorrow's Monsters, which is which takes which focuses on a completely different storyline utilizing the same technology that picks up where the last one left off. So we're very it's more it's more Frankenstein than Jekyll and Hyde second season. So I'm very excited about that one. We're about halfway through writing that series and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be tonally different. It follows a lot of different characters, has a lot of the same characters return. It's going to be a lot of fun. Really excited by that. You, you know how happy you've made me with them. Uh, <laughs> I'm more than happy to talk about it with you in the future off the record. Because I would get murdered if I gave spoilers away at this it, early day. In some ways, I don't really want spoilers, but I do mm-hmm. love the fact that it's the perfect jumping off point with the the cliffhanger and not really cliffhanger, but with the way that it's left at the end of season one, that, that there's, it's got that thing where you go into the next place now and it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say anything, but yeah. Right. But yeah. It's, it's, it's perfect because there's going to be changes possible with one character for de- for definite based on the end of season one. But right. maybe both of the main characters, but we don't know. But yeah. And yeah, and I without giving too much away, we do focus a lot in the second season on on military applications for the the product that we create in the first season. So it it gets it gets messy. I'm really excited about where we're going with it. But very quickly then I hate to be be, be speedy with this, so what would be your go-to genre film or book? One of my favorite genre books is House of Leaves. Have you read that one? No, it's, I've not read that. It is. It's Mark Danielewski, and it is the most bizarre haunted house story you'll ever read. It is. I. It, it's really hard to explain. It. The, the book itself is a strange labyrinth. But it focuses on the central characters of this couple who have a wonderful, loving relationship and what this weird obsession that one of them has with this house that they're living in. And his sort of explorations of this and the sort of hazard that he puts himself and his family in end up telling this beautiful, heartbreaking love story in the middle of this bizarre horror that you never really get to the bottom of but i highly recommend that it's just i it's a really fascinating character study and it's also a really fascinating study on what you can do with the unknown and how the unknown really can affect the human mind yeah i've read that one a couple of times it's dense it's I think I heard somebody joke about it, calling it infinite jest for spooky people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very dense, but it's just a, an absolute fantastic book. Another, another that an, an author that I frequently go to who's not known for horror, but whose writing itself uh, contains a tremendous amount of horror is Cormac McCarthy, who we were talking about earlier. I love his work. There's more than half of his more than half of his body of work that I will never touch again, having touched it once. The Road, for instance, was, they made that into a movie with Figo Mortensen a few years back. Yep. It's that post-apocalyptic man and son walking through the wasteland. And I think I burned through that in 24 hours, a sleepless 24 wow. hours. And it was devastating. And it has one of the most affecting endings I've ever read. The last paragraph is just, yeah, but it's it's something I'll never touch again because it was so devastating and, and messed up and because he's so good at writing human su- believable human suffering that it, it really truly does become uh, horror in itself. And uh, as far as films go, like, I love, love Evil Dead. I, the original with Bruce Campbell, it's campy and bizarre and so big and broad and silly and and yet it really is this 
it's just this horrifying story that is just told with so much bizarre showmanship. Yeah, that's one of those that I like going back to every once in a while when I want to be spooked out, but also get a good laugh. I'm also a huge fan of of Coppola's Dracula, the yep. Bram Stoker's Dracula. It was just accents aside. <laughs> Uh, it, it's just really beautifully told. I've always been, it's funny because it's not the kind that I write, but I've always been a big fan of very colorful operatic horror that's like a little over the top. Argento's Suspiria. I I could watch that. I'm going to watch that on mute and just watch the imagery of that all day long. It's just so fantastic and colorful. But yeah, those are a handful. Big fan of uh, Ari Aster's work too. And I, my, my old writing partner, Dave Bruckner, I'm a huge fan of, of his Night House. I don't know if you saw Night House, but it was really, really fantastic, fun film. And Dave is an excellent direct horror director, just an excellent horror director. And I say that as somebody who's watched his work from afar, but has also been in the room with him, banging ideas. Absolutely infuriating to write with, but I think that some of my best work has come out of arguments with him in the writing room so well you you mentioned the signal earlier and what stood by that and i actually really enjoyed that i I actually thought it was better than cell oh yeah i absolutely love that i think it's because i think it's because stephen king brings it out to this huge he, he, he paints the big picture so well but i think that the sort of human story that it focuses on is not as captivating as the as the bigger story about what's going on in the world whereas i think in the signal what's going on in the larger world they I, largely for budgetary reasons they couldn't show a lot of it i think that the one time there's a large crowd scene i i was actually in briefly you can't see me but they came out to this theater that we all used to work at where the dailies project used to take place and they got on the roof of this building and they had just like 60 of us in the parking lot, just fake beating the shit out of each other wow. so that you know, that you could like, so that like when the character played by song Galja, when he looks over the, who was also in tomorrow's monsters, he played mm-hmm. David Truesdale in tomorrow's monsters. He looks out over the rooftop and just sees these people just beating each other to death. That was, yeah, that was just a whole bunch of people. And they got, uh, a couple of kegs of beer, and which was a huge mistake on their part. But everybody just got drunk in the parking lot and just kept shooting this scene over. And then everybody, I think, stayed getting drunk until the, the kegs floated two hours later. It was um, a lot of fun. And I know that they were working on I saw pieces of a script for a sequel that they tried to put together a few years ago. And it would have been really fantastic. And I'm really sorry we didn't get to see that. But uh, yeah, the signal was fantastic. And it was that came out of the Dailies project, which I was talking about earlier. And if I could give like a really good piece of advice to aspiring filmmakers, writers, actors, everything is, is to work with what you have and work with the people around you. Start if you want to make a film and you have no budget and you have no experience, start a film club. Yep. Meet with like-minded people. Start realizing where your strengths lie, where their strengths lie, how they work together. People that you enjoy working with. And then keep doing that. A lot of those of us who came out of Atlanta, at least, doing this, and who are now working in the industry at large, we all started as hobbyists. I, we all started just going, we love movies, we love plays, we love podcasts, we love fiction, and and just getting to know other people who are also interested. Because eventually you can scrape together enough resources to to put together your own thing. And if your thing is horror, then you're going to do great with no budget. It's just there, it's just a matter of craft and will. Yeah, breaking into Hollywood is hard enough, but but making an independent film, though very difficult, 
is also very doable, especially now in the days of iPhones and cheaper technologies and stuff like that. You can put together something watchable. And if you do that enough times, you'll eventually put together something that's not just watchable, but something that's really enjoyable that that speaks to somebody else. It's just craft, like anything else. It's all just craft, except with film, it's a craft that is, it's a craft where you need other people. (laughs) It's really hard to make a movie alone. It can be done, but it's hard. Unless you do one of those where it's just one person talking to a camera, one of those sorts of films. That's true. And I think that like Blair Witch proved that you can do that real easy. All these other points we've already discussed, essentially, this whole thing has been, this discussion has been basically advice for people who make podcasts, who are writers, actors. We've already done all the advice thing anyway through the discussion that we've had naturally. <laughs> yeah. The, I think all the advice too just boils down to just do it and keep doing it and, and putting it out there. And eventually, it's a numbers game. Eventually, something sticks. You may not ever reach the heights of Hollywood success, but you can have a career. You can have a good long career. You just have to be willing to, to put a lot of time into it. Yep. Keep, keep up the grind. Keep tr- yeah, that's pretty much it. Hello, everybody. This is Ryan. And this is Avery. And we are from the Frame by Frame King Crimson podcast. And you are listening to Pods Like Us. Going back to my, because uh, this is originally about pod podcasting, or it was originally. What do you like to listen to yourself as podcast? I listen to a lot of food podcasts. I listen to I listen to Gastropod a lot. There's yeah. there's there's one that is about the American Southeast of uh, where I live, and it's it's called Gravy. And it's, it's about Southern foodways and history and just how what is on our plate came to be on our plate. I'm a fan of, of that sort of thing, of history, of particularly food history. I cook. So when I listen to podcasts, I listen to fiction podcasts more as a student than as, than as a, an appreciator of fiction podcasts. Yeah. And it feels like work when I'm listening to somebody else's because I'm picking it apart and like listening to how they did certain things and figuring out for my own, for my own edification and my own career or my own craft for moving forward, like how things are, how other people are doing things. Um, So I find that um, my R and R listening is usually has nothing to do with what I do professionally. Um, I do, I still, I read a lot for fun. Like I read a lot of fiction for fun, but that, I think that feels very different to me than listening to the audio because that's what I focus so much of my time on. Yeah. You put me on a tangent. We're, we're, we're coming up to the close there, but you put me on a tangent. Oh, so go, go. I, I did a show recently where I talked to these people who were starting a show about Martin Scorsese. Again, go into that. Uh, that's why is it the foremost in my mind is because I've been studying that to speak with them. Right, And they said to me, they said to me, what's my favorite? They turned it on to me and they said, what's your favorite Scorsese film? And I said, I don't know whether I'd say favorite, but I said one that really jumps out at me that's a bit out of left field in, in essence is Hugo. I said, because huh. I said, when you look at the film Hugo, I said, you see the film historian part of who Scorsese is. I said, because... When you go into the little bits of the, the character of Georges Mali, in the, that's, who's working in there, I said, when it goes to the past of his filmmaking, Scorsese breaks down how those films were made, essentially, and you see how it was all put together. And I said, those are the bits that really jump out at me in that film, because there you see the man who knows his craft, essentially, there right. within those sections. And those are the bits that really jump out at me. Yeah. You know what, this is, this, that reminds me, there's a book by the author Paul Auster called The Book of Illusions. And it is about a man who discovers a, uh, almost unknown silent film actor and goes looking for him that gets really deep into the weeds about like filmmaking and his, the history of filmmaking. And it's really, 
absolutely gorgeous. And you can tell that Oster was just in love with old film when he was writing this fictional character, when he was creating this fictional character, because he paints this character as the filmmaker so beautifully. And gets and, and literally is becomes like a, a theorist or and a critic of these imaginary films that he's created. And it's absolutely fantastic. I am a sucker for stories about experts talking about their craft. I love listening to other writers talk. And I love reading fiction about writers struggling. I don't know what it is. Very edifying. Where can people find you and get hold of you then, Nicholas? I'm on the this all the social medias if they want to find me through that. Or if they're ever in Atlanta, rightclubatl.com, the live show we do once a month. You can buy tickets online. But also Club ATL will have some of our our old podcast up there sometime too. Thank you for speaking with me today. Oh, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, this was really delightful. And uh, next time I do something, I'll give you a buzz. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward thank to you. that. You oh. can find Pods Like Us on uh, all the socials, Instagram, um, Facebook, Twitter. They call it X now. And you can also find us through Pods Like Us at gmail.com. Anyway, thank you everyone for listening. and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us. There's the sign out. Excellent. This was a lot of fun, man. Thank you for having me on. When it's coming out, I'll let you know. Please do. And uh, yeah, let me know if you're working on anything else at any point. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much. You take care. You too. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.